A deacon from the Five Ends Baptist Church shoots the neighborhood drug dealer. And the elephant gets a visit from the governor. Somehow these stories collide. The author, James McBride. The book, Deacon King Kong. And you're listening to Lit Society. Let's Let's get get lit! To Lit Society, a podcast about books and drama. So you're Harry, right. Hey. How was your week last week? You know, it was how great. How was your week this week? Yeah, it was great. Um, the sun's been shining a lot. You know, last week in, um, or a couple of weeks ago in Chicago, it was cold for no reason. I mean, like right? for real cold, like mm-hmm. 50 degrees and whatnot. So uh, we're making up for it this week Um, and the beginning of June, the middle of June with 90 degree temperatures. And, you know, I've been trying to get outside every day. It's been cool. We had people over the house for the first time in a year and a half, I think. And it felt really good. Did it? Mm hmm. Yeah. And I'm going to tell on you. Yep. So you came (laughs) over. (laughs) Alexis actually came to my house. Y'all know she don't leave the house. She took a chance for a friend. And when she found out my husband had invited two more people, she left with a quickness. We turned around. She was like Batman. And the window was open and the blinds was blowing. And she was gone. So uh, I don't blame you, girl. My nerves just hit on me. I was like, oh. People, I gotta go. I got to go. Which is exciting for you. <laughs> okay, apparently with Harriet Tubman. Um, that's <laughs> exciting for you because you're like going back to work. How you gonna do it? I got faith in you though. Exactly. I don't know. I don't know, but I one of the suggestions, I think I'm gonna try it out and we'll see how that goes over. Okay. All right. So you have some suggestions for everybody that has to go back to the office who've been yep. working from home for over a year. Ooh, yeah. mm-hmm. what a tragedy. A now, I've had to go back like to it. the office, and the only thing I'm grateful for is that I don't have to crawl out of my cave after a year and figure out how to be social again. Um, <laughs> but I still envy everybody who was able to work from home. That's mm-hmm. the way of the future. So what about you? How was your week? How you been? Tell me everything. Hmm. What's the tale? I'm not sure there's anything to tell. Did I do anything exciting? You got to take advantage of your last week of freedom (laughs) before you go back to your skyscraper. Um, Yeah, I I think the best way for me to take advantage of that is to stay home. Yeah. (laughs) It's a little longer because that's going to be a whole new life. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. A whole new life. And what's the benefit for. of going back to work? We'll talk about it, I guess. But I'm I'm aghast. I don't understand why this is happening to people. Uh, even though I've had to go in the office, I appreciate that other people haven't. Yeah, You know, especially if you got a real big city commute. What's that for? Uh, but anyway. Who knows? Anyway, it keeps the other businesses in. Business. Yeah, it keeps that rent paid downtown. Keeps the city mm-hmm. c- city in. Yep, yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Readers, each week we select a theme to discuss inspired by the book that we're reading. But this week we're going to step away from that theme of the week and talk about returning to the office and mental health. Do-do! Yes. Topical. I start transitioning back to work um, this week. And I am feeling nervous about it. And the thinking about it makes me nervous about it not and it's just in my head right now yeah but when I actually do the work I think that's when I'm going to really start to feel it Mm -hmm. you know what I mean Mm -hmm. it's going to be physical well let Um, me offer some optimistic uh, ideas whatever I don't know what I'm saying I I think that the worrying is the worst part you can wake Mm -hmm. up in the middle of night sick that you got to go back to the office I understand this It has nothing to do with if you're an extrovert or if you're an introvert. Uh, We'll get into it, but there's a comfort from working from home and being in your own bubble. And I understand that people want their employees to be team oriented. Eh, 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 You can be team oriented from the house. 
So the idea of walking back to the office, the commute, just think about it. The idea of living your life according to the bells and whistles of your phone, um, not getting up naturally because you have to make more time for your commute, getting on the train in contact with diseased, disgusting people every day. Oh, am I stressing you out? Walk into the building, Mm -hmm. the walk from the train to the building, dodging all types of elements in the city, then walking into the building to deal with microaggressions, disrespect, misunderstandings. For what? (laughs) For what? I understand. Please explain. Please (laughs) explain. Well, the, for me, I'm happy. I'm fortunate to transition back with two days a week. So I, I've got to brace myself for that initial shock of being around people again. Um, so is it really things, being around people, though, do you think? Uh, yes, it is. OK, <laughs> you know, you So and <laughs> and my um before we went into COVID, I had an office. I no longer have that private space. I am also going to be sitting in a shared desk space, which is new for <gasps> they me. They took away. And that's your a- office was bigger than my first apartment. <laughs> <laughs> it was wow. that. But it, um, th- that's going to be a huge impact for me because I'm like around people and I'm used to doing stuff because I'm by myself. You, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? I- Absolutely. It's just different. Um, so I got to go back. Mm-hmm. I don't, you know, I don't go out of my apartment much except when the, um, Kyrie pulled me out. Mm-hmm. I try. So then I'm I around her and, and the husband. Mm-hmm. And that's, um, that's okay for me. Because it's like being around no one. Let's be frank. When you uh really close to folks and they like family, it's like they don't matter. <laughs> that you love them so much that they don't matter. It's like, well, well, you know, they don't they don't really count. They're not even really people. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I found a recent survey and I think this article was dated from May 29th. And they surveyed like forty five hundred office workers from five different countries. And every single person felt anxious about the idea of returning to work in person. Wow. Wow. That's huge, right? 100%. Every single person. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. 100%. Another um, survey said the same thing. They cited concerns of exposure to COVID, the lack of flexibility, and the commute into work. So, again, why are we doing this again? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, and then some people feel pressured. I have a, a friend who said she really felt like, like throughout the pandemic, they were pressuring them to go back to work. Like um, they would even make little comments about it. Like you people are, that are working from home are working less because the rest of the team was at the office and just a small portion were at home. So that pressure um, creates <laughs> additional anxiety on the people because they're concerned about their their job. So was there any evidence that those working from home were working less efficiently, producing less than their counterparts who were in the office? Nope, they haven't proved that. Mm -hmm. She hasn't said there um, there's been any proof of that. Can you tell me what the top causes of return to work stress would be? Now I mentioned a couple, but what else do you think would be included in that? Okay, so you want me to um, guess like what, what were the top things these people were worried about who have to go back into the office? Right. Um, So as a writer, to work from home produces uh, more um, freedom when you're trying to create. So going back into the office, there's more people over your shoulder. Some people like to give you uh, a copywriting assignment and literally stand over your shoulder and go, I'm just watching. Yikes. Can I tell you that's insane? But that happens. It is. Um, So I would think a big stress would just be that constant. Um break into your psyche (laughs) that can disturb your workflow. Also micromanagement. Um, That can be some um, overseers managing style. Naturally, they don't know how to not micromanage. That can cause frustration. And then again, microaggressions with coworkers, um, petty stuff that you don't want to get into office politics that you don't want to be a part of because it's not part of your job description. You want to stay out of that and produce good work. Um, but that's harder to do when you're in the office. So that would mm-hmm. be my guess. Well, it was none of those. And those were <laughs> all great. And um, 
So where like was it then? Probably just below that. If you had to go on, those were probably just below this, the top ones, which were, again, being exposed to COVID. Oh, COVID. I forgot. That's the whole reason people at home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And everyone's acting like it just don't exist no more. So Right. The loss of work flexibility. So that's kind of included in what you're saying. If somebody's standing over you, you don't have flexibility. Mm-hmm. You just don't. Um, the added commute. You mentioned that. And that then you're not a- getting paid for. Mm-hmm. You know, it took me an hour and a half to get home um, four days last week. Whew, that's so, a lot. Yeah. And then wearing a mask while in the office. Mm. And then for those with um, children, the need for child care. This is like an entire shift people have to adapt to mm-hmm. when it comes to going back to work. And then I found a, a study the article mentioned a study from Flex Jobs where they surveyed 2,100 people who have been working remotely. And then they found that 58% of workers said that they would absolutely look for a new job if they weren't allowed to continue working. Yeah, remotely. I saw that. Mm-hmm. People are thinking of just quitting. That's really interesting to me. I mean, if you pay for child care, mm-hmm. it's one thing to have someone come over your house and watch your children while you're working from home. It's another thing to pay for your kids to be somewhere during the day. The cost yeah. of that is insane. Some people yeah. work just for the child care. Right. So you have to think, should I just be at home with my kids? But then exactly. you put a huge period in your career exactly. uh, where you're not working. That's a real catch 22 situation where it's like, mm-hmm. what do I do? Um, yeah, I get it. So work from home is perfect because you have the child care there likely, but you're still able to produce for the company um, and not have that huge cost. Exactly. Exactly. So I found an article. It's called Returning to Work Soon. Here are some ways to make the process easier. Health essentials from the Cleveland Clinic. You familiar with the Cleveland Clinic? Mm -mm. It's a very popular um, Health organization, oh. kind of like Rush here in Chicago, the Illinois area. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, if you have a return to work date looming over your head, you might be struggling with the thought of having to leave the comfort, that pod of safety that's at home, right? To then go into the office or wherever your workplace is that's filled with uncertainty, right? Mm. And it's, they say it's not weird to have that apprehensive feeling about returning to work. Because we've been in this, you know, cocoon of safety for so long, which is our home. Mm -hmm. So they're calling it reentry anxiety. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing. And there's two forms of it. The first involves leaving your home and unknowingly contracting COVID or even spreading it. And the second is the social interactions. As we know, some anxiety can be good. But too much anxiety can be paralyzing. The article gave some suggestions for mentally preparing for that return. The first one, use your imagination to walk through scenarios you might encounter at work. I thought that was an um, interesting take. Mm-hmm. I guess it's more has to do with um, when people approach you as it relates to maybe mask and social distancing or or just think about what your fears are maybe related or your anxieties are related to it and um kind of imagine those and what your response would be to those so yeah and if you're go ahead i'm sorry no go ahead if you're leading um large company meetings weekly and you've been working from home and those meetings have been online. You've had all your notes in front of you. And now you have to um, give the appearance of, yes. you know, memorizing all this stuff. And, you know, you have to kind of put on a show that can be uh, uh, that can fill you with anxiety. I could I can definitely see that. Um, so visualizing how that'll go. Practice sessions at mm-hmm. home in front of your cat. That's perfectly fine. Or a dog. <laughs> yeah. Or dog, yeah. <laughs> Number two, do a dry run before you return to the office, before your official return to work day. Um, I think that's what I'm going to do. Go back before your initial start date. Look around, see what's changed for our office. There have been people there 
So I know they've kept it clean. Um, so it's not about cleaning up my space, but for some people, it may be about cleaning up your space. They suggest maybe adding some new pictures, Plants. bringing in a plant. Yeah, yes. they help reduce your stress levels. Um, a diffuser, I, if it's allowed. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, now that I share space, I don't know how that's going to work. Yeah, I don't know. Number three, give your wardrobe a makeover. No more leggings, sweatshirts, and tank tops or wraps. Is Rent the Runway still around? <laughs> yeah, they are. Then I you get know an what? email from them often. While you working through those uh, last five or ten quarantine um, pounds, go and rent the runway. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> and when you get where you want to get, go and buy some clothes. But in the meantime, have fun picking out a new outfit, you know, exactly. every week. Whatever. You know, the model mm-hmm. look good, feel good. Yeah. Yeah. It'll make a difference for you. And I actually thought about that. I said, maybe I should buy myself something new. So I was really glad this article said that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Number four, establish a better sleep schedule. So depending on what your home environment was, your sleep schedule could have been all over the place. So many people's sleep schedules are trash from working from home. Mm -hmm. So getting more sleep will help um, reduce the emotional eating um, and help buffer you emotionally and physically against the wear and tear of stress. So Setting a sleep pattern, maybe the week before you go back into the work, try going to bed at the same time every night and waking up at the same time every day, just to kind of jump back into that routine. If you're having safety concerns, spell out your expectations to your employer. Ask your employer for their COVID safety policy. Read through the policy. Don't just ask for it, read through it. Employers must follow the established safety policy protocols for COVID. If you have a leadership that's lax about COVID um, guidelines, then you take your own precautions. Keep wearing your mask and have your sanitizer at your desk. Let people know. The um, second one is, as it relates to safety concerns, is letting people know that you're still practicing physical distancing and it would be helpful um, to practice what you say before that happens, you know, cause you don't want to come off as rude. So, you know, practice it so that you're um, speaking your word uh, in an assertive manner, but at the same time, With kindness. kindly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like just maybe just as a suggestion, say, Hey dummy, we in the middle of a pandemic. Why are you so close to me? <laughs> I think that's as kind as you need to be. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding, I don't know. Guys. I don't know if that's nice. Don't call that's people dumb. <laughs> mm. Everybody's return to work situation is different. Some people have been at work the entire time. So that's their, me. Their situation <laughs> is even different. And some people went back to work months ago. Some people are going back gradually. Some people are going back all at once, like my um, friend I mentioned earlier. Whatever your situation, be honest with yourself about how you feel. Take note of your concerns and address them. Also, try to think of the positive sides of returning to work. Now, I haven't come up with any, but Kari, if you have some, I'd love to hear them. Well, I have some tips for going back to the office that have helped me, even though I only had like a month at home in quarantine and then I was back. (laughs) Okay, can I just say I'm very fortunate because on our floor at my job, there's mm -hmm. only like Two to four of us at a time. Sometimes it's just you on the whole floor. So if your anxieties over COVID are dissipated. Um, So that's nice. Uh, One thing, two things, though, I want to suggest that may help is to or actually three things. Um, Number one. What was it? I just had it on the tip of my tongue. (laughs) Okay, I can't think of number one. Number two. Do something for other people. So um, oh. when I'm when I have anxiety on my floor, I know I can buy everyone a gift, maybe like a plant for their desk, something that they won't feel like, oh, I got to leave this here now because Kari bought it for me. Some maybe smaller <laughs> that they won't mind keeping on their desk, bringing in, you know, fruit, bringing in donuts, bringing in treats. Uh, for everyone. Um, yeah, it can aid to that communal feel that managers want, I guess. But it also makes you feel more part of a team, or at least it makes me feel more part of a team. So I like to do that, especially if you like your coworkers, um, like I do overall. So um, it's nice to just do something for them at the top of the day. 
Uh, number three, what I really like to do is to have a to do list, which means um, when anxiety takes over your mind and you're like, oh, and you just want to do that for an hour. Oh, yeah. Nope. Your to do list is there so you can go. No, I can do this task. I am mentally able to do these three things this hour and then return to the larger project or things like that. So having a prioritized to do list really helps me get through the day. And if you're filled with anxiety at your desk, that may help you also. I really like that you mentioned going in early, go in early with some donuts, you know. If that's going to make everybody angry because they like, you know, we trying to lose these five, 10 pounds, <laughs> then, you know, that's come so in early thing. with some a fresh fruit basket, you know, mm-hmm. some flowers, something, you know, we all in this. We ain't in this together. What am I trying to say? But, you know, <laughs> we all going through it. We might as well act like we in it together. Yeah, well, the year's been hard for everybody. This so that's is the thing. That's true. Whether you've been in the office the entire time or at home, it's been a challenge for everybody in one way or another. And I remember number one, cardio. Cardio is a great stress reliever. If you can't run because it's 90 degrees when you wake up, get a Peloton. You got it. You got to go to work anyway. Might as well save up for that Peloton. <laughs> Yes, um, get a Peloton. Yeah. That's the answer. Yeah, I'm just going to borrow the work one. <laughs> there you go. If you got, if you work in the ritzy place where they got Pelotons <laughs> like Alexis job, hop on one of them. Then you're waking up early for you. And mm-hmm. that mindset can help a lot when you finally make it into the office. You're giving everyone their flowers or their candy and you sit down with your to do list. Oh, Kari, I love that. I think I'm going to try to be kind to people. It is. (laughs) You're very kind. So (laughs) I'm not sure that's true. But anyway, (laughs) of course, if you're experiencing extreme anxiety or unable to complete your task, your daily tasks after returning to work, don't hesitate to talk to somebody um, in the mental health profession. They'd be glad to help you. And readers, if you're still working for home or have plans to return to the office, let us know in the comments on YouTube. Please. Yeah. And if you're in a different country, um, we have a lot of readers in Europe, or readers, listeners in Europe. Let us know what it's like. Like, are y'all in the office? Are y'all working from home? What's going on? And how do you mm-hmm. feel about it? Um, yeah. Let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Mm-hmm. Well, let's take a quick break before we jump into the author and context. Cool beans. Kari, mm-hmm. what do you have for us on our author? Any context? Any yeah. Any author details? Yeah, James McBride is a renaissance man. He was born September 11, 1957. He's a writer, musician, journalist, um, film writer. What do you call those people? Screenwriters? He's mm-hmm. one of them, too. I bet he's got a side card. He was born to a black American reverend father and a Jewish turned Christian mom. He was raised in Brooklyn's Red Hook housing projects until he was seven. Um, One statement I want to pull from him. He says, I'm proud of my Jewish history. Technically, I guess you could say I'm Jewish since my mother was Jewish, but she converted to Christianity. So the question is for theologians to answer. I just get up in the morning, happy to be living. Mm. Now, McBride's uh, memoir is called The Color of Water, A Black Man's Tribute to His White Mother. And it was published in 1995. It describes his family history and his relationship with his mom. That memoir won an Ainsfield Wolf Book Award. It spent over two years on the New York Times bestseller list. Um, It's become like an American classic uh, taught in high schools across the country, translated into 16 languages and has sold more than 2.5 million copies. Have you ever heard of it? Uh, Yes, I've heard of it. I have not. Oh, wow. (laughs) Which isn't shocking. It's so much I don't know. So uh, especially about literature. Welcome to this literature podcast. (laughs) I (laughs) co-host. So, yeah, again, that's The Color of Water, a Mm -hmm. black man's tribute to his white mother, published in 1995. It describes his life growing up in a large, poor American, um, African-American family, black American family led by his white Jewish mother. She was strict and the daughter of an Orthodox rabbi. 
During her first marriage to McBride's dad, Reverend Andrew McBride, she converted to Christianity and became a devout Christian. Um, Yeah, her story seems really interesting. I would like to read that book. In 2002, he published, McBride published a novel called Miracle on St. Anna. Are you familiar? That one I'm not familiar with. Well, you should, because I remember sitting on a bus with you in Italy as we drove past the location and the <laughs> the guide was telling us about it. But it draws on the history of an overwhelmingly African-American um, 92nd Infantry Division in the Italian campaign from the mid-1944 to um, years to April 1945. So like a year. Um, the book, again, that's Miracle at St. Anna. That talks about this black American infantry that like saved an area of Italy. That book was adapted into a movie by Spike Lee called Miracle at St. Anna uh, released in 2008. And that's not the Yeah, that's not the last time Spike Lee and McBride worked together. And in McBride's writing, that's who I think of. No, I'm like, wow, Spike Lee wrote (laughs) books. Absolutely. Um, Because his writing style, the way he. Uh, fills each character with information and you are um, informed of who this person is by their dialogue. That's all so Spike Lee, the way the neighborhood is the main character. That's so Spike Lee. Well, in Mm -hmm. 2012, McBride co-wrote and co-produced Red Hook Summer uh, with Spike Lee. So they've worked together a couple of times. In 2016, President Barack Obama awarded McBride the 2015 National Humanities Award. Medal for humanizing the complexities of discussing race in America through writings about his own unique American history and his works of fiction informed by our shared history. Um, his his moving stories, um, Barack says, uh, of love display the character of the American family. In last year, December 2020, it was reported that his novel Deacon King Kong, which we're featuring today, made 16 lists of best books of 2020. While in February of this year, it won an Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction. And lastly, I just want to quote an interview that he gave to Entertainment Weekly uh, magazine online. They asked him, what was the last book to make you laugh and the last book to make you cry? For both, he gave one book. He says, A Man Called Uwe. Well, what? you know, it's yes. from Frederick Buckman. Yeah, and we said, we want to read it. The yes. Swedish version of the movie based on the book already out there. And Tame Ho- Tom Hanks was Tame Hawks. What am I saying today? <laughs> Tom Hanks was supposed to star in the American version. That was put on hold because of COVID. Um, but there are plans for that. Uh, McBride says that book, A Man Called Uwe by Frederick Beckman. That's his name, right? Frederick Beckman. It's, I think so. it's a magnificent. No, no? <laughs> you'll give it to me. So yeah. he says it's a magnificent, magnificent homage to humanity and to the possibility of friendship and faith in long lasting love. It covers a lot of ground. Marriage, love, race, class, division and gentrification. It's one of those good stories that connects Frederick Beckman. I think I said Backman. Back. Yes, Backman. Mm-hmm. Okay. He says Frederick Backman. Wow, he really put that thing together. Mm. And that's James McBride. Do you have anything on the author since you're familiar with him? No. Yeah. Um. Last year in my search for books to read, his came up. That one. Which one? Um, the memoir. Yeah. So why haven't you added it to the list? What do you think? It's it's on the list. I just mm. haven't pulled it forward. You know, I've got these long lists. And Same. I just have to um, pull one forward from the list. Yeah. People are always asking why we don't ask for more book recommendations. Yeah, we will. <laughs> but we have so many books we trying to read. Yeah. Um, but yeah, still send us your recommendations. Thank mm-hmm. you. We have included some of those on the schedule. Yeah. They um, just so get in it. They just get put on the list. And, yeah. You know, they gradually move forward slowly. Gradually inching. being the keyword. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So that's James McBride. Well, thank you so much for sharing that information. Really good stuff. Um, Now let's hear a brief synopsis without spoilers before we begin our deep dive. Happily, in broad daylight, seemingly for no reason, an old man, recently widowed, shoots a young drug dealer orphan in the head. What happens next involves nearly everyone, including the Blacks, the Italians, the Irish, in one dying Brooklyn neighborhood. Alexis, what were your first thoughts of Deacon King Kong? 
you know, I, it was it was hard. I'm I'm thinking about that cover, and I'm like, what is this book about? Is it same <laughs> deacon? I know what a deacon is, but it what is? I was just lost, but <laughs> of course, ready to dig into a new book. So, you know, I picked it up. How about you? Who do you think would enjoy reading this book? Well, just going back to first thoughts, I was not into reading this book this week. I was only doing it because of the show. Um, and I felt like this is going to be heavy and it's going to be about race and pain and black suffering. And I'm tired. It wasn't about it was it wasn't really about any of those things. So I'm no. um, glad I dove in. And I think if if you are, again, really into those character novels and novels that um, are centered in a small space, like um a book that comes to mind is Woman in the Window that really just takes place in a house, a little bit in a cafe, a little bit in a hospital, a little bit at a police station, but really just in a house. This book takes place in one neighborhood and everyone's lives are so rich and intertwined. So if that that appeals to you, then you may be interested in this book. OK, great. So are we ready to take our spin into this book because we're going to do a little something different, right, Kari? Yeah, that's right. So you guys, if you're a longtime listener of this show, first of all, hey, hey, you should know we're trying something different in this episode. For a while now, I have especially been sick of spoiling books for y'all, especially is this true when the book is released within the last year or the last two years. So today we're going to experiment with a spoiler free episode format. Now, I know this isn't what you expect from us. And if you hate it, guess what? Let us know. Run on over to IG or Twitter, e email us, whatever. Let us know. We're yeah. open to criticism. Mm -hmm. Now, let's begin. Alexis, I'm going to set up the premise of this book instead of diving into the plot. And it all begins with one single action by a man named Sport Coat. Deacon King Kong, our namesake, and Sport Coat, one in the same, by the way. Old sport coach shot a drug dealer in the face. Now, when you read that, what comes to your mind? What do you think happened? Of course, the drug dealer is dead. That's but, my he did. Mm -hmm. He did. OK, so old sport coach shoots a drug dealer in the face and instantly becomes a dead man walking. No one knew why sport coach did what he did. There were witnesses all around, including a police officer, a mom walking a baby. Yeah, everybody, everybody saw it. Saw it. No one seems to know what happened. <laughs> they saw it. They don't know what they saw. What happened? Yeah. So who is Sport Coat? Let's back up. Sport Coat is a good time loving old church deacon and a pillar in the neighborhood. His wife, Hetty, died years ago in a snowstorm. And I say her name with happiness because he loved her so much and he describes her in such a loving way um, in his internal di dialogue. Um, she saw the snow during a snowstorm from her window and just strangely like stood up and was like, I'm going to find moonflies. And wow. yeah, walk to the pier, the local pier. She thought she was following the light of God um, is like the explanation that Deacon King Kong sport coat uh, decides on. She was the breadwinner as sport coat hadn't had a steady job in years the local Baptist pastor reluctantly um, leads a prayer for her in her at her funeral. But her body was found days later um, drowned in the pier. You so, know, another thing about mm -hmm. her is that everybody in the community and the church, they all knew how much he loved his wife. Yeah. I yeah. He's that was characterized. Uh, one young troubled young man characterizes sport coat as one of the few men he knows to be genuinely happy mm -hmm. sport coat is hat is a he's a drunk he has faults okay he is a troubled person in a lot of ways but he's a happy man happily married happily living yeah um and he's really devoted to his wife the day of hetty's funeral is where we begin the book and the situation is perfect for introducing us to the neighborhood it reminds me of animal farm <laughs> Oddly enough, when um, old major is about to give his speech and everyone, you know, Gathers files around. into the barn 
So you get to meet everyone as the reader. Well, that's how the funeral is. Everyone's showing up, some worn from the night before, some hungover. Uh, but Sportcoat is in great shape. He'd spent the previous evening with Rufus celebrating Hetty's life, his um, late wife. Rufus made a blend of white lightning. You know what white lightning is? Yes, I've had some experience with that. Yeah, yeah. White light. Yeah, white lightning, like apple pie, all of that is moonshine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But uh, Rufus's white lightning or his moonshine is known as King King Kong. Kong. You get the title. Mm -hmm. So (laughs) we got the Deacon sport coat whose real name I'm going to tell you, I don't even remember uh, because he's just sport coat. (laughs) He's a deacon and he likes to drink his King Kong. So they call him Deacon King Kong. Even after her death, um, Sport Coat continued to fuss after his wife, mostly about um, missing money from the church Christmas fund. He's arguing with her. And this is like, I want to say a phenomenon. No, it's a coping mechanism yeah. that I have actually um, seen. Uh, I can think of a time when a widower didn't know that I was in earshot and he was talking to his late wife. Really? And that helps people. Yeah, that helps mm-hmm. people like deal with this loss, especially men. They say men um, don't have confidants like women do. So you'll notice maybe a man remarries fast, very quickly after his wife died. That doesn't mean he didn't love her. Right. Um, but who is he supposed to talk to? Who is he supposed to commiserate with throughout his day? Um, who understands him anymore? So to cope with that huge hole, um, some people will continue talking to their um, spouse even after they pass. And that's what Sport Coat does. And he likes to argue with her. <laughs> He loves this woman and they like to argue. So he will argue with her. There's a Christmas church fund missing. And so he's fussing about her, fussing at her about it because she oversee, oversaw the church fund and they don't know where the money is. He don't know where the money is. The church don't know where the money is. And now the woman who oversaw all of that is dead. So they're like, where the money? Um, and she never told coat. anybody. She never told her husband. She really he's kept that. Drunk. She really kept that. <laughs> Um, close secret. to the chest. Yeah, close. Mm-hmm. She kept it close to the chest so that you know nothing would happen. But I don't think there was ever a concern about him taking. He, no one describes him as that kind of person. He's not a thief, right? So he is worried though that people might suspect him of taking mm-hmm. it, and so he wants to know where the money is. So he's always talking to her about it with no one talking back except in his mind. Yeah. And everyone in the neighborhood has decided, oh, he's a little crazy because they can see him talking to uh, right. Hetty and walking the street. But that's okay because everyone's a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> However, everyone's crazy could be explained. And in this book, they take a moment to explain everyone's crazy, and it is entertaining. Okay. <laughs> So everyone's yeah. crazy could be explained until that is sport coach shot that drug dealer in the head. That couldn't be explained by anyone. Locals decided sport coat was a dead man. Any day now, someone's going to get revenge, you know. Sport coat, sister Veronica G of 5N says soberly, is a sick man. She was right. At 71, Sportcoat had contracted almost every disease known to man. He had gout. He had piles. He had rheumatoid arthritis, which crippled his back so bad he limped like a hunchback on overcast days. He had a cyst on his left arm the size of a lemon and a hernia in his groin the size of an orange. When the hernia grew to the size of a grapefruit, doctors recommended surgery. Sportcoat ignored them. So a kind social worker at the local health clinic signed him up for every alternative therapy known to man. Acupuncture, magnet therapy, herbal remedies, holistic healing, applying leeches, gait analysis, and plant remedies with genetic variations. None of them worked. With each failure, his health declined further, and the death predictions grew more frequent and ominous. But not one of them came true. The fact is, unbeknownst to the residents of the cause, the death of Cuffy Jasper Lampkin, which was Sports Coat's real name, had been predicted long before he arrived to the cause houses. When he was slapped to life back in Possum Point, South Carolina, 71 years before, the midwife who delivered him watched in horror as a bird flew through an open window and fluttered over the baby's head, then flew out again, a bad sign. 
she announced he's gonna be an idiot handed him to his mother and vanished moving to washington dc where she married a plumber and never delivered another baby again bad luck seemed to follow the baby wherever he went baby cuffy got colic typhoid fever the measles the mumps and scarlet fever at age two he swallowed everything marbles rocks dirt spoons and once he got a kitchen ladle caught in his ear which had to be extracted by a doctor over at the university hospital in columbia at age three when a young local pastor came by to bless the baby the child barfed green matter all over the pastor's clean white shirt the pastor announced he's got the devil's understanding and departed for Chicago, where he quit the gospel and became a blues singer named Tampa Red and recorded the monster hit song, Devil's Understanding, before dying in anonymity, flat broke, and crawling into history immortalized in music studies and rock and roll college courses the world over. Idolized by white writers and music intellectuals for his classic blues hit, that was the bedrock of the $40 million gospel stamp music publishing empire for which neither he nor sports coat ever received a dime. Okay. I thought, first of all, that's actually hilarious. And I love the like slapstick humor, how the nurse was like, he gonna be an idiot. She decided <laughs> never to deliver another baby. Come on. That's brilliant. Who writes like this? <laughs> Uh, so at 14, Sportcoat was a drunk and a godsend for dental students who needed practice to earn their certification. So explain this to me, Alexis, <laughs> because he drinks, his teeth are falling out and his bones are cracking. What's going on? I didn't know that. I didn't know that drinking caused um, problems with your bones. I, I, I haven't heard that before. However, I, I he is drinking maybe, moonshine. He so was, who knows what it is. Exactly. Who knows what's in that? I was thinking maybe he was falling and, you know, hurting himself and maybe uh, tripping yeah, maybe. and that kind of thing. Maybe he lost a tooth and had to have it repaired. You know, that kind of thing. I can see that. OK, so he's a gift to not just dental students, but also <laughs> surgeons, because he's both an idiot and a genius, a human disaster and a medical miracle. After a million surgeries, he's still around and kicking and doing great. <laughs> so, you know, he's um, an anomaly. As an old man, he's a lovable drunk with a sweet wife and a blind, um, chunky son. He actually is the son's name chunky. I can't remember the son's name, Hold but on, it's descriptive. I'm, I'm get it to it. Let me get to it. Okay, while you look for it, uh, I'll explain that sport coat taught all the neighborhood boys how to play baseball. Um, that was his thing. So he gave them like this gift, something he was interested in and good at. He helped them develop their talents with hopes that they would grow bigger than the neighborhood and get a future for themselves, uh, possibly with baseball, play for a good team, not the Cubs, uh, not the Mets, <laughs> someone great. So, yeah, that's <laughs> that's. <laughs> Someone great. That's sport coat. And everyone seems to be endeared to him. He has no enemies. He is happy. Part two. Oh, did you find a baby name? No. <laughs> Don't worry about it, girl. Yeah. Okay. So part two, bullets and tuna. Listen, as we said, there are many witnesses, including Pudgy a fingers. Pudgy fingers is the son's name. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, as we said, there are many witnesses, including a cop, and no one said anything. Sport Coat was the one who taught the drug dealer how to throw a baseball, who took him under his wing, who taught him at church. He was like a um, substitute father for this young man mm -hmm. that found himself um, to be an orphan very early in life. So, for Sport Coat to walk up to him, Everyone was aghast. OK, um, so this baseball that he taught the boy was a skill he was more than good at the drug dealer. He was great at baseball, but that was before he lost his role model, who was his grandfather. Um, so he had like sport coat and his grandfather as strong men in his life. His grandfather died. And then after that, he became desperate and in need of money. And now that kid was 19 and he sold drugs. And sport coat shot him in the ear so hard that the young man <laughs> choked on his tuna sandwich. <laughs> so there we go. A surprise. That young man, not really a spoiler. He's alive. OK, I'm not taking anything away from the story. I promise. Everyone scattered as the young man attempted to retrieve the sandwich from his esophagus. I know that feeling. 
<laughs> while positioned on the ground on all fours. So this is like the neighborhood's biggest gangster. An old widower walks up to him, shoots his ear off. The big, everyone, you know, scatters. The big gangster is on the ground like a dog um, about to get walked because... <laughs> Sport coat sees the boy on his hands and knees and thinks to himself, no man should die on his hands and knees. So sport coat jumps behind the boy. He gets on his knees and performs the Heimlich. Okay. But to passers by, it looked as if sport coat has shot the man and began humping him, adding to the drug dealer's humiliation. So people are going, man, sport coat is ruthless. He done shot that boy. Now he humping him in front of everybody. It's so crazy. Eventually, the sandwich is dislodged. The drug dealer again does not die. And that drug dealer's name, by the way, is Deems Clemens. Also, by the way, Hot Sausage, a local vagrant, visits Sport Coat at one of his many jobs. So Sport Coat drinks all day, but he also works a lot. He's got a lot of jobs. And Hot Sausage is a friend. Hot Sausage um, is a janitor. <laughs> He's not a vagrant. Oh, do, oh, you can't have a job and be a vagrant. Listen, all they do is drink all day and gossip. And, and it don't sound like he clean that well, but whatever. Um, so, oh, no, he's also like a handyman. He's yes. not just a janitor. He's like a soup of the building. Yeah, he's a soup of the a building, competent not the electrician. Mm -hmm. But yeah. his electrician skills are so, so they're just late in life and like kind of like good timey men. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so Hot Sausage visits Sport Coat and it's like, Sport Coat, man, you got to run before this drug dealer deems kills you. And Sport Coat is shocked. Like, what are you talking about, Hot Sausage? Like, and Hot Sausage is like, you shot Deems. Like, say what, come again? Huh? Say, huh? Who shot who? Listen. What you talking about? He starts thinking, Sport Coat starts thinking. He's like, was I drunk? Did I shoot somebody? He seems to have no recollection of shooting anyone. And thus, he's not afraid of any repercussions. None. <laughs> he doesn't remember stopping uh, Hot, uh, Hot Sausage. He doesn't remember stopping Deems from choking. Don't remember hopping behind him to the shame of Deems in front of the whole neighborhood. He don't remember that. Hot Sausage pleads with Sport Coat, get out of town. And Sport Coat is like, no, I'm drinking. I'm hanging out. I uh, got one of my many jobs to go to. I'm not going to do that. Sport Coat is adamant. He didn't shoot anyone. Hot Sausage tells Sport Coat, I love this, by the way. Hot Sausage tells his friend, if I was a fly and wanted to get to heaven, I'd throw myself in your mouth. <laughs> this is one of the many one-liners of the book. And there are many. Many. <laughs> so listen, Sport Coat is walking around, living his life like there's no price on his head. His main concern? Is the missing Christmas fund money from the church. That's all he cares about. And he everybody, <laughs> everybody is like, he needs to get out of here. He's going <laughs> to die soon. They're going to take revenge on him. Yeah, literally everyone, because he's making his rounds to the deacons, deaconesses, and pastors, letting them know he has no idea where the money is. You got to believe me. <laughs> and old friends recommend he goes and sees a friend of Hetty's, his wife. Um, they're like, you know, maybe her friend knows uh, where the money is. And he like, she had friends. <laughs> <laughs> and what do, what do his friends go? You know, women don't tell you nothing. That's why I never got married. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> that old woman, the friend of his late wife, she was around when the church first started. In fact, it was started in her home. Her husband was the pastor. Sport Coat considers seeing the old woman about the money when a man in a black leather coat sneaks out of a broom closet and inches behind him in a dark stairway. The man is silently holding a metal pipe above Sport Coat's head. Sport Coat may be unaware of his imminent demise, but thankfully the man with the pipe is knocked back into the broom closet by a baseball. Two kids no older than nine pick up the ball, <laughs> greet Sport Coat, like, hey, Sport Coat, and then they run outside. Sport Coat goes, haven't y'all ever heard of a baseball field? completely unaware that them two cheerings who he probably taught baseball have saved his life. The hitman then fights his way out of the closet after everyone is gone. He's covered in bleach and mouse traps, complete with furry victims in their wires. <laughs> this is one of the slapstick scenes of the book. They land very well. Would you agree? Alexis? I, oh, I totally agree. I totally agree. And I can't do them justice. So we'll move on at this point in the story. Still the beginning. 
This is like all in the first few chapters. Mm -hmm. We now know the police, too, are looking for sport coat. All right. So I think I've set up the book. How do you feel? Yeah, I think you set it up pretty well. Have I spoiled anything for the reader? You know, I think spoilers are different to different people. Yeah. So the main plot twist, any turns in the book, those will still be shockers to you. Um, Now I want to talk about some themes I found in the book. What is this book really about? For me, this book is about death and love. So first of all, death. This book begins and ends with a funeral. What do you think, Alexis, the author is trying to tell us with this choice? Starting with the funeral? And ending with it. Hmm. That's interesting. Two different funerals. Yeah. Yeah. It, that's interesting. Um, I don't know. That's interesting. Yeah. I was thinking people die. We know that. But so does hope. And so do communities and tradition. And this area of Brooklyn is dying. The old ways are dying because of heroin. So um, all these. mm -hmm, And that's that's talked about. That's um, a common theme, common conversation throughout the book. So I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. So um, as is typical with neighborhoods across America, there were old um, crimes that found their way into society. And people learn to not just live with them, but thrive with them in the confines of their neighborhoods. Those include racketeering, Mm -hmm. um, numbers, you know, numbers, numbers games, games, things like that. Yeah, I don't really know what racketeering is. (laughs) Um, So uh, (laughs) when drugs moved in, though, it was an international business with so much money involved that people's quote unquote morality went out the window. So it used to be that immoral people still had their principles, still stuff you wouldn't go and do. But with drugs, you know, you might sell drugs to a child. Some grandmas were hooked on smack and would send their grandbabies to the local drug dealer to get them their um, drug of choice. So the neighborhoods are dying. Communities and traditions are dying in this book. Um, But we're in this like perfect spot just before they collapse. And we're meeting the old timers and the new folks who are, you know, eventually going to lead to the demise of this way of life. But uh, we get to know them as people. The author doesn't pull back in showing you their goods and their bad right. sides. Um, right. I think um, a com- a statement in the book that I really like is somebody said, um, and I can't remember who it was. He said, this um, neighborhood got bad because of the the colors mm-hmm, because, yeah, of, the because colors. of the colors and he said mm-hmm. no this neighborhood is bad because of the drugs yeah and so that yeah. definitely goes to um what you're saying of how that time period ending that peace ending yeah and it was um during this period where they thought they could just keep drugs in the black neighborhoods right who cares about black people anyway um, and then one old gangster is thinking, do they think black people are dumb? <laughs> they got guns just like we got guns. You know, um, they organize just like we organize. The drugs that we're putting in their communities will find their way into our children's schools. But it's too late. It is yeah. what it is. Um, there's a side story here about church cheese. <laughs> so <laughs> I thought this was government cheese. It used I to be back so in the too. day. <laughs> I say that's government cheese. Yeah. So like as a form of welfare, the government would give um, communities cheese and different um, groceries for free. Um, but the cheese I heard was really good. Well, this ain't that. Somehow <laughs> free cheese. <laughs> And you just had a cheese party. We like cheese we over like here on cheese. the List Society yeah, podcast. Like <laughs> so I was like, oh, this book made me want to eat some cheese and drink some moonshine. Um, so somehow the church regularly receives a whole lot of really good cheese and quality people line cheese. up for miles. Yeah. What'd you say? Quality cheese. Yeah. Yeah. Quality cheese. Better than even the government stuff. This is fine cheese. And people line up for it uh, for miles. <laughs> Uh, And no one knows, no one in this old church knows how the cheese gets there. They just get it and give it out to everybody. Mm -hmm. And this is like some consistency that doesn't die until it does. Um, But I love that there's like the stability, this good thing everyone can always depend on. And it's cheese. What do you think? Who do you think, by the way, is providing cheese in the story? And, you know, don't feel bad about spoiling it because spoiler, (laughs) mild spoiler. We never know. We never know for sure who's giving out this cheese or providing the church with cheese. But who do you think it is? Yeah. So I really thought it was the um, the father 
of um the uh, elefante is a big gangster in the neighborhood yeah. and you think it's his dad who it was for sure in the beginning but who continued it, it i think it was yeah. the, his wife i think it was the wife yeah yeah there's something that hetty's friend um says about wives and how they know everything that's going on in the household yeah. And it is confirmed that whoever's dropping off the cheese to this old black church is Italian. Yeah. So I think it, yeah, I think it was the mom too. Let us know what you guys, who you guys think was dropping off the cheese in the church. Uh, tell us. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So that's one of the themes to me. First, death and inconsistency, I'll say. Second, though, love. And I'm going to start with the ants. Another side story is um, one about ants about insects <laughs> really interesting <laughs> there are these ants that are not naturally a part of the environment that have filled the projects okay and they consume everything just like love they'll eat a dog these ants they eat possums they eat rats okay i don't know if these ants exist but i could believe it it was very believable <laughs> do you remember how the ants got to the projects <laughs> Yes, I do remember. Shall I? Yes, please. Okay, so this man left his wife. Uh He left his wife in Mexico. Okay, he left his wife in Mexico and she was like, no, stay with me. Please stay with me. And he was like, no, you know, they don't really have. I'm American now. I'm I'm American now and we can't really take country wives. So I'm going to (laughs) go. I promise I'll continue to take care of you and your children. Yeah, <laughs> like they ain't his children yeah. too. I'll continue, but I promise. But I, I gotta go. And he was feeling good that he, you know, I did that. I said what mm-hmm. I'm gonna do, and I walked away. I feel good about this. Yeah, but she packed but, him but a lunch. He asked her, yeah, but he asked her for the lunch, didn't he? I think before so. I leave, why don't you make me a lunch? Is that, I don't remember how that went. Insane. But a lunch was provided, and she got them him this new lunch box, and he brought this lunch box back with him and when he got to the apartment no he was at work oh (laughs) he got to work (laughs) do you want me to finish it (laughs) he got to work sat down opened that lunchbox and it was a note saying we know you ain't sending nothing and it was full of these mexican ants and they just overtook the table crawled everywhere (laughs) okay and that's how the ants got there and that too is related to love they came in this lunchbox of this two-time husband from mexico and they devour everything everything and then there's like the love between sport coat and the gangster he shot deems Mm -hmm. deems is headed for death (laughs) okay he's a drug dealer and there's not really uh, many places that occupation can go except the grave. And that's kind of like a metaphor for the neighborhood too. sport coat is trying to save um, this. Uh, what's good about this old way of life by trying to save deems in his own way, we find out. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's a love there. There's like a, a familial type of love between sport coat and the boys of the neighborhood who are making these bad decisions. And then love is something that might even find us for the first time when we're past our youth, as is the case with two relationships in this book. And the way falling in love is described now these two people are married to other people so that ain't good at all right um but the way that they're falling in love especially since one uh, marriage for sure ends and possibly they both in their marriages maybe i don't know it would um, not imply that at all no not for <laughs> okay. the other one so um yeah so the way there that love is described with these older people it's uh, really endearing. Mm-hmm. It is. It's very well written and you like fall in love with the people. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The sight of her lovely brown face breaking into laughter and focusing tightly on him as she stood in the dress of azaleas in the sunlit yard of weeds made him feel light again. In that moment, he realized that all the experience of 32 years on the NYPD and all the formal police training in the world was useless when the smile of someone you suddenly care about finds the bow that wraps your heart and undoes it. He wondered when he'd last had that feeling, indeed, if he'd ever had it at all. For the life of him, he couldn't remember. 
standing there in knee-high weeds behind an old black church he passed by a hundred times over the last two decades without so much as a glance. He wondered if he had ever actually been in love, or if love was, as his grandmother used to say, a kind of discovery of magic. He loved the stories she read to him when he was a boy, of kings and seafaring maidens and sailors gone awire and monsters slain, all for the sake of love. Who is it who throws the light into the meeting on the mountain? It was a poem she loved. He tried to recall the poet's name. Was it Yeats, maybe? He saw her staring at him and realized she was waiting for him to say something. I think Mitch has lost interest in the case, he managed to say. Who? Mitch, the other officer, my partner. Good. So have I, she said. She shifted the weed cutter to the other side and leaned on it again. One smooth hip thrust outward. Oh, I'm trying to. We truck on here, despite it all. Look at all these weeds. You do this often, she smiled. Not enough. You cut them down, they come right back. You cut them again, they come back again. That's their purpose, to keep coming. Everything under God's sun got a purpose in this world. Everything wants to live. Everything deserves life, really. If everything deserves to live, why kill a weed? She chuckled. She loved this kind of talk. How was it that he could draw this foolish chatter out of her? Her discourse with her husband, what little conversation they had, was made up of stunted, dry, matter-of-fact grunts about paid bills, church business, the affairs of their three grown children who were thankfully living away from the cause houses. At 48, most days she awakened feeling like there was nothing left to live for other than her church and her children. She had been 17 when she wed a man 12 years older than her. He had seemed to have a purpose, but turned out to have none other than an affinity for football games and the ability to pretend to be what he was not, to pretend to feel things that he did not feel, to make jokes out of things that did not work for him. And like too many men she knew, daydream about meeting some lovely young thing from the choir, preferably at 3 a.m. in the choir pew. She didn't hate her husband. She just didn't know him. I could let the weeds grow, she said. But I'm not a person who knows enough about what should or should not be to leave things as they are when they got no purpose that I can understand. My purpose is to keep this church open long enough to save somebody. That's all I know. If I was a book-learned person, somebody who could use 34 words instead of three words to say what I mean, I might know the full answer to your question. But I'm a simple woman, officer. These weeds is a blight to this house of worship. So I goes at them. The truth is, they do me no harm. They're unsightly to me, but sightly to God. And still, I cuts at them. I reckon I'm like most folks. Most times, I don't know what I'm doing. Sometimes I feel like I don't hardly know enough to tie my own shoes. I can tie your shoes for you, he said, his eyes twinkling. If you can't manage. Oh, (laughs) I had that highlighted. It's so beautiful to me. I agree. Um, The way that love is sparked and then uh, develops is explained beautifully by Mr. McBride. Mm-hmm. So, and then there's a love story between the old gangster and um, an old Italian gangster and an old Irish gangster's daughter. Yeah. Um, that I'm not as attached to that love story, but I see its merit. It's done really well. Mm-hmm. So, so those were the two themes that stood out to me from this book. What themes for you um, stood out, and what did you find? You know. That was really stuck with you as far as um, so definitely for me, the love that was so weaved in this story throughout. um, And and you talked a lot about it, but certainly the love for the drug dealer and um, his shooter. Right. Yeah. The idea. Yeah. The idea of wanting to find love. There are mm-hmm. people that want to find love and they're um and, some, and that doesn't have to go away. Yeah. And then there then the love that um 
sport code had for his wife. Oh, yes, of course. The yeah. love that is lacked. The people who don't oh, have love. My goodness. Can I just tell you the um, church woman whose husband left her? I love how she hates him. <laughs> she she hate hates him. him with a passion. And she is always looking for new ways to make his life terrible. And it's hilarious. It's so they much hate, hate each other. Hate. But he left her for someone else. So he kind of like content. She is actively despising him. Yeah, like it's great. It's, she, she produces a lot of the one liners I love in this book. She is like really, really bitter. And it starts with that early on. So that's quite entertaining. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, So the love thread is throughout lack of and the existence of the wanting of love that is like totally weaved throughout that. I would almost say it was a love story. It could be a love story for the community. You know what I mean? Yeah. Everybody loved that community. Um, If I think about Sister G and how she loved the church um, and Mm -hmm. and the work that the church did for the people. Love is a, talked about in so many different ways. Um, by the end of it, I felt like it was a, a love story. The book was a, lo- a romance novel, essentially. Even there, there mm-hmm. were so many other things tied to that. I really felt that way because so much of it was talking about how people love and what kind of love they receive or didn't receive. Yeah, there's more than a love between partners, um, a, that type of romantic love. There are so many other types of love besides Eros. There's brotherly love. There's love that you can have for family members. And all of those types of love are like explored really well in this book Um, and the opposite of them and (laughs) and what that means. Uh, And then Um, I'm sorry, go ahead. There's a scene where they're having a party for a boy who went to jail as a boy and came home a man. That touched my heart. Mm -hmm. Parties for people who... normalize again if this is not normal parties for people who are released from jail Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) i love it i love it i love it i love celebrating someone come home coming home because jail can be like going to your grave Mm. and so if you are resurrected from that there should be a party Mm -hmm. (laughs) especially if no one believes you did it (laughs) whatever (laughs) you were accused of um so i i felt like that's so uh entrenched in certain communities I, I just love it. I loved I loved being in that party. I loved the band. I loved the um <laughs> that was a great petty story. spats. <laughs> yeah. I I loved um people just having a good time and just celebrating this one person's life, which they're able to live another day on the outside. Mm-hmm. That's so cool. Yeah, it was a nice big party. Another thing that I um thought about is the care for the elderly in here. That yes. is in here a lot. And um, you know, someone's character, if they're good, even if they're a gangster mm-hmm. by how they treat the old people mm-hmm. and the gangster in this book um, seem yeah. to have a respect for the old people and what like he wouldn't do certain things. Yeah. Deans won't times. sell drugs to grandparents yeah. or to children. Yeah. So before that, he would he would wait until these older people were gone. Yes, the church people. Yeah, he would wait for the church And then he'd sell his drugs in the then, park. Yeah, so that had a, uh, while he was selling to the elderly people, he did have a, a bit of respect for the, more of the church, maybe. That's what it was. It was his Yeah, because his late church. grandfather was like a church man. And it reminded him of his late grandfather, all these old people being together. And he had love for them and for sport coach. Yeah, so there was a, a level of uh, respect there. Yeah, Elefante and, takes care of his um, aging mother very well. And then it, Sport Coat cares for this older Elefante's mom. Oh, sure, yeah. In that sense as well. And then the elderly woman at the end, uh, Hetty's friend, is being cared for by the elderly man in the chair, yeah, the, the security, security guard. guard. So you find you this book is really about community and mm-hmm. caring for the community that you're in um, as it changes and transitions to whatever it's transitioning to. It's 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 capturing that. And that I felt like was a really beautiful piece. I love that. Well, let's introduce another segment. Um, In the beginning of our show, we always talk about who would love this book. And we kind of talk about how this book is alike, is similar to other books that our readers might enjoy. But let's talk about why this book is unique. What makes this book different? 
Um, for me, I will say it's the one liners. Every section of this book, it's a page turner in that every line um, fills you with something, whether it's, um, you know, it's rarely sadness. It's mostly happiness, even when sad things are happening and humor. This book is hilarious. A few of my favorite one liners. I said this already, but when um, Sausage tells Sport Coat, if I was a fly and wanted to get to heaven, I would jump in your mouth. <laughs> How do you write that? Uh, what else? At least I ain't got enough wrinkles in my face to hold 10 days worth of rain. <laughs> what? Too much. It's so much funny stuff. That's in this hilarious. Book. Yeah. What about you? What, what to you makes this book unique? I love the stories of the characters, the yeah. merging. And I'm sure that happens in other books, but where everyone's the, intertwined their lives. Yes. They're all intertwined. Um, the Italians with the, the black people and the um, Irish, the Jewish. Puerto Ricans, oh, yeah. the Dominicans, yeah, the Dominicans, Haitian. the yeah. Haitians. Feels real all, New York. I love it. Mm-hmm, they're all together and, and then they're merging into the other side, which is supposed to be the better side of the tracks, if you will. Um, Their communities are merging, we find in the book, and they definitely come together. And I love the way that story is told. Yeah, there's also great attention to detail in the book. There's a moment when Potts, who's an officer who um, has befriended Sister G, he's standing looking at her with the Statue of Liberty in the background. And there's something about that scene um, and the contrast between the lives they've led. She's never even been on the um, Staten Island Staten Ferry. Island Ferry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, in this one city, in this one neighborhood, they live very different lives. And um, James McBride really shows you that without telling you. He's describing the scene and from it, you can harvest um, all these details that he's putting in there. Very well done. Yeah, well, that's all I got. Anything else you'd like to share without spoilers? Um, no, I said, no, okay. I'm going to pass. Well, let's get into our final verdict. You want to take a break? Yes. Let's do it. Yes. All right. And we're back. Alexis. What did you think of Deacon King Kong and would you recommend this book? Okay, so listen, I, I don't know if you can tell how giddy I was <laughs> as you were telling the story. I obviously like the book. I enjoyed it very much, but I will say that there is some strong language in this book. Consistently. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, and that can be a reason why I wouldn't recommend it to people. Mm-hmm. but. Um, If you don't mind that, dive in. But it it does have some strong language. And I laughed and smiled the whole way through this book. Mm -hmm. I really did. I really did. How about you, Kari? I agree with you 100%, but I don't like this book. I love it. (laughs) I love it. And the language, is it does what it's supposed to do. So there's a part where Deems is um, cursing out sport coat and it makes i hate disrespect to old people and that's how i'm supposed to feel in that scene i'm supposed to feel uncomfortable yes Yes. he's talking to him like he's a dog and i hate it and i'm supposed Mm -hmm. to this book does it gave what it was supposed to give (laughs) and i think james mcbride is one of the best writers i've come across um this book has made me reevaluate how i write copy for advertisements how i write fiction um, the way you can tell a story, you know, uh, writers are always told, stop using adjectives. <laughs> Just stop. <laughs> what They're are told adjectives? To stop? Really? Absolutely. There oh, are wow. so much. There are um, better ways to describe a scene. Instead of saying the uh, fluffy black pillow, you yeah. could describe a pillow. Um, you talk about the wool that's used in it, maybe the cotton inside of it. And you can use those descriptions to paint a picture or foreshadow what's going to come about in this story. There are better ways to write. James McBride has been to that school and he taught the class 
He's Ooh. very good. He's very, very good. good. These one line laugh out loud. It reminded me of a crass book we read uh, called uh, <sighs> Confederacy of Dunces. Yeah, I thought about that a couple of times. Yes. So for that episode, I also tried to give like an overview, but that just uh, melted into a pool of laughter. It was useless. This book is about <laughs> things, but is also just about the side stories that keep you laughing. Yeah. It keeps you laughing. I think for that reason, it's great for anxiety. I think our theme of the week um, when we're talking about everyone going back to the office pick up the audio and maybe listen to this again. The language is strong consistently through the book. We have to say that, but um, maybe listen to this on your commute so you can laugh out loud before you go in. I mean, you'll fall in love with these characters. I think they'll remind you of people in your family. Um, maybe people from your old neighborhood. You'll see. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and then, you know what? The, um, the reader, he's read other books that he's read another book that we did. Oh, the audio. audio so you listen to the audio book? Yeah. I and what to other book did he read? Come on. Exhalation. Oh, wow. Um, and, Ted and Chain. I think it, yeah, Ted Chain's Escal. Es, oh, I can't say that word. Exhalation. Was, yes, that one. Definitely he did that. And he did um, the particular story. I think the one that had to do with the daughter and the father. Okay. And their relationship. I don't know if you remember that one, but yeah, I, I can't remember exactly what that really. I think it was about a memory thing because he, re- yes, he remembered the relationship one way, and she she remembered it, you know, as she felt the like the correct happened. way. Yeah. Ultimately. Okay, so that was him reading. Well, he was the um auto audio book reader was obviously great, right? Yeah. So mm-hmm, I um. <laughs> I was like, his voice sounds so familiar. Who is he? I know we listened to him before. And sure enough, yep. And shout out to readers of audiobooks. Thank you. I mean, <laughs> listeners of audiobooks. Listeners too. And the people who, re- the listeners love the readers. Thank you. When you do a great job. I don't know why Omari Hardwick, side note, he re- he was the reader for, um, I listened to. Um, Dapper Dan's book. Dapper Dan's memoir. Omari Hardwick was the reader. Excellent job. Where Excellent I job. The book. Such, such a fun age. I forget that reader's name, but where I can close the book and be like, the book's great, but this reader is adding some <laughs> sauce and I want the sauce. So, uh, yeah, but yeah, Deacon King Kong, that. I love this book. Uh, great choice, me. Uh, and I yeah. didn't want to read it. And I was so happy. It wasn't the downer I thought it was going to be. It was just the opposite. It was about all the things that I was afraid it was going to be about, but it presented it in a way where I didn't have any, I wasn't reliving trauma. This, yeah. um, I saw my uncles in here. I saw my um, old Italian friends who have said three words in their lifetime, it seems, but you know <laughs> them, you love them. Um, I saw my cousins. Uh, yeah. So I love this book. It was like going home. Yeah, it's beautiful. So Kari, what are we reading next week? I know this. Curtain by Agatha Christie. Yes, yes, The Curtain by Agatha Christie. Thank you for listening to Lit Society. We'll look forward to meeting up with you next week, Thursday. Lit Society is brought to you by Alexis Anaria and Kari Herrera. Support the cause by leaving a five-star review for our show on Apple Podcasts, along with a comment about why you absolutely love us, because we love you too. Yeah, and if you hated this no-spoiler version of our show, don't talk Talk about it on Apple Podcasts now. Don't just email us. Go email us. Talk about the IG Twitter. Okay, thank you. If you enjoy what you just heard, though, tell your friends. Tell your friends about Lit Society. Visit LitSocietyPod.com for show notes, this month's book list, and to sign up for our amazing email newsletter. And until next time, readers, read, read something. something.